For centuries, humankind has dreamed of living among the stars. And this really took off in the 1950s and 60s with science fiction books and movies of outposts on the moon and adventures um, on colonies on Mars. And who was not captivated a year ago with the movie The Martian by best-selling author Andy Weir of an uh, astronaut who gets uh, left for dead in a sandstorm only to revive and then having to survive in the harsh environment of the red planet, Mars. Closer to home, though, and reality is Elon Musk of SpaceX, whose real dream is to settle Mars. With the spaceship going there from him as early as 2024, and in 50 years having factories and pizza joints. So the premise here is that planetary settlement is not a question of if, but rather a question of when. And the, and the reasons why are getting very interesting in the discussion is much more than the traditional values of science and exploration and discovery. Over the last few years, the discuss, uh, discussions have centered around human sustainability and human survivability, uh, becoming a multi-planet species to become risk averse of some cataclys uh, cataclysmic event that might wipe out the whole human race. And the dinosaurs certainly knew about extinction, didn't they? 66 million years ago, a large comet or asteroid impacted into the southern part of the uh, Gulf of Mexico in the Yucatan Peninsula. And it produced a, a huge tsunami that wiped out the plant and animal life all across North America. But worse, it produced a huge upwelling of debris and material that shrouded our planet and prevented the solar energy from the sun from reaching the surface, resulting in a cooling off period and the extinction of the dinosaurs. Some have comically said that the extinction of the dinosaurs was because they didn't have a space program. <laughs> but we've got a space program. And the debate is whether to go to the moon or Mars. Some say we need to just bypass the moon, do not pass go, do not collect $200, go straight to Mars with maybe a couple hundred people to become multi-planet uh, species. Others say, no, forget Mars, let's just go the direct to the moon. I and other scientists and engineers think we ought to go to Mars, but by way of the moon, using the moon to test the technologies and the concepts and develop the ideas for how we can live off the planet. Because the moon is only three days away, where Mars is a year and a half away. And who does not remember the first footstep on the moon with Neil Armstrong on Apollo 11? But who remembers the last footstep? December 1972, Apollo 17 was the last manned lunar mission to the moon. It ended the 10 years of the Apollo program. It sat on the moon for 10 days, and over, or over three days, they conducted three long spacewalks, even riding around in an electric car. They found orange soil on their exploration, which was orange glass from volcanic eruptions millions of years ago. It even included the first scientist on the moon, a geologist, Dr. Harrison Jack Schmidt. But when they left, many of us thought, just a few years, we'll be back to exploring the moon with humans again. Or maybe we'll use the Apollo program as a stepping stone to now move on to Mars. But it was not to be. It has been 45 years since we've had a footstep on the moon. It is time to go back to the moon. The moon is very different today than it was during the Apollo program. In the time period of Apollo, we thought it was not only airless, but waterless, that any water that might exist would just sublimate away. How wrong we were, how very wrong we were. Since 2008, we have known that there's water on the moon, lots of water. One estimate indicates that there could be 10 billion metric tons of water. That's billion with a B. 
enough water that would fill the Great Salt Lake in Utah. And the water is a game changer for us. It exhibits new capabilities for resources. See, on the International Space Station, it orbits the Earth in low Earth orbit every 90 minutes. But it is totally dependent on the Earth for supplies. It is totally reliant on the Earth for food, for water, for air, for, for clothing, for propellant. And as we go on to expand humanity among the stars, we can't operate that way where we're dependent on the Earth. We have to become not Earth-reliant, but Earth-independent and be able to live in a different type of model, one that is called living off the land. The Polynesian voyagers really understood this concept. Up until this point, when they began voyaging across the oceans, maybe a thousand years ago, mankind was moving along the continents through land bridges. But the Polynesian voyagers, in a sense, became the first astronauts. They went in uncharted oceans in the Pacific between Polynesia, Easter Island, the Hawaiian Islands, and back, that great triangle. And when they made these, made these journeys, they didn't take years and years of supplies with them of food and water and clothes. They took just enough to make the journey to where they would get to the destination. And then once arriving there, they would live off the land. We call this a, a very special name, in situ resource utilization. In situ meaning that where you are, the location you are, resource utilization, meaning to use those resources where you are to sustain yourself uh, over a long period of time. And the water becomes the big game changer. It is the gold of space. Because not only can we drink it, but we can separate the water into its elemental components of hydrogen and oxygen. We can breathe the oxygen but we can also use the gases of hydrogen and oxygen for reactants, for fuel cell, for energy. But most importantly, we can use it for propellant. Cryogenic hydrogen and cryogenic oxygen are the most powerful propellants for rocket engines. So what this allows us to do is not have to lift all the propellant in a rocket to escape Earth. We can just put enough to get away from Earth and then refill up at a gas station, a fuel depot, in or around the moon to allow our planetary journeys to continue. Construction material is very similar in resource utilization. When we go to moon and Mars to make these outposts or settlements, we're not going to take steel and, and iron with us from the earth. We're not going to take rebar. We're not going to go to Home Depot and load a bunch of lumber in a spaceship and launch it to Mars. Ain't going to happen. Just not going to be like that. We'll use what's there. We'll use the volcanic material, the, the lava, the basalt, for building landing pads, for shelters, for roads, for sidewalks. And our whole thinking of civil engineering has to change. Because now on Mars we're in 1 4th G. On the moon we're in 1 6th G. So what does that mean in terms of construction standards and codes for load-bearing walls and non-load-bearing walls on those areas? And, of course, we'll also use this for um, materials on, on the, um, uh, for making electronics and tools. And then also resource prospecting. We want to go find out what the water, where the water is. What is the constituency of the water? What does it look like? Where is the best place to mine? Where are the easiest place to have access? And are there some places that we could build a landing or an outpost site that's co-located with some of these deposits? So prospecting, much as in the gold rush days, and th this time instead of for water, is going to be critical in this, in this resource utilization effort. And then lastly, using the resources on Moon or Mars to make solar rays to collect solar energy for power and also thermal energy for keeping warm at night. The, the concept of this is very interesting as we see some of the, these mission scenarios play out. In almost every case that I see, humans don't go first like we did in Apollo. The robots and rovers go first to prospect and find the water and begin assembling the outpost to make landing pads all robotically, to begin putting the outpost and hooking them together like Lego sets, uh, to build infrastructure and sidewalks, and then the humans come to work side by side with the humans. 
So let's envision what one of those scenarios might be. Let's say we get a large lander and put down a very powerful uh, energy system because you can't do anything without power. That's number one. And secondly, we would have a high bandwidth communication device on the spacecraft to allow us to do telerobotic operations from Earth to all these rovers and robots that are doing the construction for us. And then, much like a military sortie, when we go into a remote area, we want to co-locate co all those assets, right? So we'll bring down our second lander close to the first lander, and all that sounds great, doesn't it? But it doesn't work that way on Moon and Mars. Here on Earth, when we fire a rocket engine and it, it uh, interfaces with the dust of Earth, the thick atmosphere of Earth creates these big dust clouds, these boiling clouds. But on Mars and the Moon, where there's little or no atmosphere, it doesn't work that way at all. In fact, on the Moon and Mars, instead of billowing clouds, it's a very thick sheet of very tense, dense dust. The dust on the Moon is about 150 microns in diameter. It's about the size of talcum powder, like flour. But it's not soft like talc. It's very brittle, very hard. It's it's essentially shards of broken glass. Over millions of years, micrometeorites and cosmic rays have just broken all the lunar soil up and the Mars soil into very small fragments. So you've got this very thick dust sheet of glass that is about two degrees off the horizon, very close to the horizon, and it travels close to 2,000 meters per second. Almost escape velocity for the moon. Far faster than a sand blaster. In the Apollo days, it's interesting, the astronauts tell me that when the engines were running just after touchdown, these dust sheets were created and they could see the, the tops of boulders very clearly. But the dust sheet and blow was obscured by this dense sheet. And when the engine stopped, they could see the tail of the dust sheet heading away from the lunar spacecraft and then out and over the horizon. Incredible. So it's a major problem because anything that's in line of sight of that fast-moving dust sheet, solar rays, radiators, rovers, settlements, could just be blown away, destroyed. So this has led us to a requirement that we need to first off, when we get there, build a landing pad to stabilize the surface to control the dust. This is one that we built uh, robotically in Hawaii about 18 months ago. We got similar material dust in Hawaii that's like Moon and Mars. We cooked it in a kiln and made one foot by one foot pavers, like brick pavers, uh, each weighing about 20 pounds. And then the rover uh, with a front blade did leveling and grading and compaction, just like we would do a sidewalk or a street. And then a robotic arm put these 100 pavers down in a 10 by 10 matrix to make a landing pad. But I intentionally did not grout in between the gaps of the pavers because I wanted to see what would happen in worst case with gaps if we did a rocket engine firing. So I went and bought a 2,000 pound rocket engine, put it on a fixed service structure gantry over the landing pad and lit the thing off. And this is what it looked like. The gases got down in between the the pavers and you see the pad lift and settle and then lift again with the gases and then it just throws these 20 pound pavers around like tinker toys. It was amazing. I didn't think we'd have that much damage. And I went, oh, you know, this isn't good. <laughs> you know, back to the drawing board. You know, it didn't quite work like I thought it was going to work. Totally destroyed the pad. And you know what also I figured out is is that unlike the space shuttle program that I directed, when we go to settle on Moon and Mars, we need different academic skills. We need civil engineers. We need architects. We need geologists and volcanologists and roboticists. We need people that understand uh, farming and, and uh, growing plants inside domes like we saw on the Martian. So it's a, a whole new thinking also of skills that we t need when we go to Moon and Mars. And then, interesting enough, there's also the concept of doing 3D printing to make these shelters. Today's technology, I don't know if you know, but we can 3D print a house with concrete in 48 hours with conduit. So we could take that same approach to the moon instead of using concrete, we use the batch material that is the fine grain, the flour that's on moon and Mars to make these shelters. And so as we look forward to going to Moon and Mars, 
we're going to have a little different mindset. I am a child of Apollo, as many of you are. I, I was two or three years short of being able to work on the lunar programs. The moon has very, always been very passionate to me. I think in the next few years, we're going to be seeing uh, technology demonstrations on the moon that lay the groundwork for settlements for on the moon and Mars. Imagine making the first brick on the moon or drilling for the first time on the moon or figuring out what kind of ice it is on the moon. We just don't know. But it's going to lead us in all these concepts as we test them in the close proximity of the moon to earth as we develop and feed forward those concepts for settlement on Mars. So as we say in Hawaii, mahalo nui loa, thank you very much for allowing me to come and share with you today. Mahalo.